so now we're on to question six. And um, yeah, so so notice that in this case, uh, we you know, if you did math, you didn't have to answer this question. So this is for computer scientists, mathematics, and computer scientists, or computer science. So if you did maths and physics or maths, you didn't have to do this. OK. So we have this a flexidecimal number consisting of sequence and digits with the rule that the rightmost digit must be 0, 1. The digit to the left of it is 0, 1, 2. And the digit 3 of it is MOS3, etc. So, for example, a flexidecimal number um, is like this. So you have 1, 0, so that's less than 2. This is, 1 is less than 3. Uh, 4 is less than or equal to 4, so that works. And then 3 is less than 5. So you have most of those numbers appearing. Uh, so, for example, the, the biggest number you can make here in, in some sense is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 which really makes you think of factorials, uh, you know, in some way. In some way. So um, now it tells us how to add 1. So 1 is represented by the flexidecimal 1. And um, to add 1, we work from right to left. So if the rightmost digit of D1 is 0, replace it by 1 and finish. On the other hand, if D1, uh, if D1 is going to be like 1, then you replace it by 0 and examine the digit left to it, D2. And you append the, the zero at the end. Um, so, for example, uh, example process is you go like this: you start with one. So, what's one plus one? That's two. So, that's you know, it's going to be greater than one. So, we put it a zero in this right here. So, zero here, and then we look at the next one. And so, um, if D two is so, it says here, uh, examine the digit appending a zero to the S if need be. So, we append a zero, right? And now we say if D2 is less than 2, then increase it by 1. So in, in our case, D2 was 0, right? So we increase it by 1 and we get 1, 0. And then we stop. Um, if we add now 1 to this guy, well, at the first stage, we get 0. So we add 1, we just get 11. And then we add 1 to this guy and we get, well, that is going to be greater than 1. So we put a 0 here, 0 there. And then 1 plus 1 is 2, so we stay at 2, 0. So adding is a bit strange. And so I encourage you to just work with that and see if you can add numbers. Um, so the first part asks us to write 5 to 13 flex decimals. And so we're given that 4 is 2, 0, and we just keep adding 1. So for example, uh, for here, we just get 2, 1. Uh, for 6, uh, the one the, when you have 2, 1, the 1 goes to 0, and then the 2 goes to 0 because 2 is, yeah, then you, you, would, you, know, you, you can imagine going to 3, but because it's greater than 2, you can't. So you get 0, and then you get 1, 0, 0. So you can just check that yourself when you go through it, that you just get that. Um, and then the other follows just by keep repeating that process. So part two asks us to, do, to find a workable procedure for converting flexidecimals to decimals and explain why it works. Okay, so when we keep adding a one, what do we notice? We have these expressions here, right? And we notice that once we get to 2, 1, for example, then when you add 1, you get to 1, 0, 0. So, and 1, 0, 0 corresponds to 6. So how many numbers do we get, do we need to get to here? Well, to get to 2, 1, we need to add, you know, uh, we need to add like 1, 0, like 2 times, where, you know, 1, 0 corresponds to 2, so we get 0, 1, and then 1, 0, 1, 1, right? 2, 0, 2, 1. So we had to get to six, we needed two, three lots of these, of going zero ones in the, uh, you know, rightmost expression. So we need six. And indeed, you can then check, you know, that 1,000 will be 24, so full factorial. So this six is three factorial because you have three lots of two, and the next one's going to be four lots of, of three, right? And so you keep going like that. So we have this... Uh, system where 1,000 corresponds to 24, uh, et cetera. And so what can we do? Well, we, if we need a number, we can just uh, we can just write, you know, the, the decimal corresponds. So what do we, what do we ask for? It? Convert it to a decimal, right? So we know when we have a flexi number, like say, you know, at 1, you know, 1, 1, 1, well, that would correspond to doing 24 plus uh, 
uh, you know, twenty sorry, twenty-four plus six plus uh, three uh, plus two plus one, for example. And so, um, and so basically, you just you just write out like this in terms of a um, let's just be a two, sorry. Um, in terms of uh, you know, a sum factorial. So it's like a binary system here. And um, and so the, this this expression here represents the flexidecimal here. So we just do k factorial times this plus uh, k minus one factorial times this, etc. And so you can just yeah, you can just check that that you know works. But um, not only that, it really makes sense because it's like a like binary, but in some sort of k factorial sort of sense. And um, and now it also describes a workable procedure for converting decimals to flexidecimals, right? And so. The way to do that is to just invert it. So if I get like, you know, 255, I find the factorial that's closest to it. So say like 120, which is five factorial, and I multiply it by two, so I get, you know, 240, and that's gonna be like two in the fifth column for the flexidecimal or the sixth column, you know, whatever it is. So you kind of like binary, you just convert it into a sum like this form where each of the a k plus ones, a k minus one is less than or equal to k. And you can do that. Okay, so now it's asking us for a way to add flexidecimals. And um, so the naive way when we carry, right? So if, say we want to add 20 and 20. Um, so we did, so we want to do that. So we know 20 is represented by four, so our total should be eight. If we just add and carry, right? So so we add, we, we add it like vertically. So we go 20, 20 and 20. Right, and then we just did it. So we go with zero here, and then we get the four here, right? And because we know that in this second column it can be at most two, do we carry you know one or do we carry two, right? Because four is greater than two by two amount. Say we carry the two, so we put a zero here, and then we get a two. So that'd be two hundred in the flexidecimal setting, right? And so we got this. But now by our formula before, we can see that two hundred actually corresponds to twelve, not eight. So in fact, that's not the way we need to do it. And, um, and so what are we going to do? Well, we're going to write in algebra to see what will happen. So we're going to convert it into a decimal. So, so we say 20 equals 2 times 2 factorial. And when we add together, we should get 4 times 2 factorial. And now how can this be rewritten? Well, 4 times 2 factorial, the 4 is a 3 plus 1, right? So it's going to be a 3 factorial plus a 2 factorial. And if flexidecimal is actually going to be 2 one uh, zero zero, right? Because sorry, uh, in flexidecimal, this is going to be uh, one one zero zero. Yeah. So sorry, not one, not two zero, but one zero zero. And so now we see where we went wrong, right? Um, we saw that we thought the four would carry a two when it was you know when it's two above two, but it doesn't do that. It uh it instead uh, if it was four, you know you find the the remainder of four in three, and that's one. And so you, then you, you get three factorial plus the remainder, which is two fact, uh, one times two factorial. And then, so the answer to this question, you can then formulate in your own words. And so um, is that the, this carrying procedure, whereby it's not so obvious, but there's a little tricky part there, but you can verify that yourself. Okay, so we finished the flexidecimal. Uh, no, we didn't finish the flexidecimal questions, but um, the next parts, I encourage you to try yourself because they're not too uh, difficult and just apply in this process that we had described. All right, and so this we have this last question, question seven. This is for the computer science and philosophy uh, in particular. And um, and so this is another example of kind of a recurrence. And so I will not, uh, I just want to explain some key points and, um, and then uh, let you also work on this yourself because uh, it's, it's, a, it's good to kind of get in the habit of this. So the question is, uh, we have an integer display on two, uh, two identical boxes and we press some buttons, A and B. The button A resets it to zero and the button B um, applies a fixed function. That's apparently really complex, right? And so once it's set to zero, we then get a sequence. X equals zero, X1 equals F of X zero, and X2 equals F of X1, which is F of F of X zero. 
And you have no pencil and paper, so you can't do any computations. And so part one explains briefly why there must exist integers such that xi equals xj. Right? And so the point is here is that you have an n-digit display. Right? There are two to the n possible, a 10 to the n possible combinations, or 10, yeah, 10 to the n. Right? And so if you continue this f and you keep applying it on and on and on, you can apply it infinitely many times, right? So, but because you only have a finite amount of states, you know, if you do, if you do like, so say that to 10 to the n, say you had 10 to the n plus one state, uh, iterations of f, then you have to hit one of those 10 to the n states twice. And that's, so part one explains why eventually this process terminates. And that's because doing, you could repeat it indefinitely, but you only have a finite number of state spaces. And that applies more generally. So if you have a finite number of state spaces and you keep applying a function, you have to at least repeat some, some way you know, somewhere in that state space. Now, part two asks us to show if that if you have a point where xi equals xj, then x to the i plus s equals x to the j plus s for any s, right? Um, so that means that if I apply f to xi, I get, you know, f xi plus one, and I apply f to xj, I get, uh, you know, f uh, xj plus one. The point is, is that because you input a function that these all have to be the same. So if I apply f to xi and f to xi, xj, I get xi plus one, xj plus one, they have to be the same. If I apply it to, um, if I apply, you know, s times, it doesn't matter. You know, I still get the same thing. So that's, this is what this is saying. It's just saying I'm applying f to the same value. So I get um, the same, it's the same after that point. So it's like a periodic sequence. Now, part three asks us, let m be the smallest number such that xm appears more than once. And let p be the smallest number such that xm equals xm plus p. Show that xi plus k equals xi, right? And so the idea here is that um, for all i greater than or equal to m. So we know after xm that, uh, you know, xm will appear more than once in the list, right? Now, x of i will be some iteration of, f, f, um, of xm, right? It's going to be, say, f to the m minus i of xm, right? This is going to be some iteration after uh, applying f uh, this amount of times. And so we just apply that. So we know that um, xi is going to be f of, say, l or f, f to the l of xm. And because xm repeats, uh, xi will also repeat. And therefore, you can think of it as like p is now the period of the, the sequence. So, so it repeats every p numbers after m. And so xi will be to the equal to the xi plus p equals xi two plus 2p, etc. And that's why you get this out. So the main thing I just wanted to say was uh, this part here. So part four. Um, part four asks to say, given integers ij, where i is a single j, show that x i equals x j if and only if i is smaller than, is greater than equal to m, because that's the first time you get equality, so that has to happen, and j minus i is a multiple of p. And so the point here is, and I, and I would encourage you to try it, is that p is the period, so it has to be the, the, the smallest, uh, you know, um, kind of difference between uh, two equal numbers has to be p, right? So it can't be anything less. So, 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 so the point is, is that if, um, if this happens, then indeed we know that way. But what about if xi equals xj, then we have to show this this way, right? And, um, and so we know that i has to be greater than or equal to m, that's a given. So why is the difference divisible by p? And the reason is, is because, and let me just do this by example. So say m was, uh, you know, 10 and p was 2. So every 2 repeats. And then say you had, um, you know, uh, x, uh, sorry, let's say a p was, say, 5. So every 5 it repeats. And so say you had uh, some, you know, 16 is equal to... Uh, 25, say, so So the 16th number is equal to the 25th number. So now we know in particular that this is not 
a multiple, but we know that uh, 16 minus 25 is nine, which is not a multiple of five, right? So what do we do? Well, we know that when we apply every five number, it, it, it's the same. So we know that f of, uh, so we know 16th number is the 21st number, and it's also the 26th number. But here's the problem, 26 and 25, we said that 25, right? 25th number is equal to the 16th number. But now we look at the 26th number, and that's the same as the 16th number, is therefore the same as the 25th number, right? And that means that we have now a difference of one, um, and that just can't happen, right? Because um, two numbers consecutive are a distance of one apart, and we said that P is the smallest value for which you have a periodic uh, system. So, um, so that's why it can't happen. And so I encourage you to try to work out details and prove by example that um, a similar, extend that argument to the case where um, uh, to four for a general system. So try to, from say I was smaller than J, try to find the smallest value such that I plus KP is gonna be a J minus I plus KP. So in brackets, I minus plus KP is gonna be um, some remainder R but R is less than P, and then sure that has to be, yeah, and that just can't happen.